All right, so we're close to noon here, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's fitting that we are here on World Food Day. Also, it's Norman Borlaug Day, um, as proclaimed by Governor Reynolds yesterday down at the Iowa Hunger Summit. Um, and we're truly lucky to have joining us here today um, the 2016, one of the 2016 World Food Prize laureates, um, Dr. Jan Lowe. She has focused her career on integrating nutritional concerns into agricultural programs. She is currently a principal scientist based at the International Potato Center's regional office. Dr. Lowe has spearheaded research to build the evidence base demonstrating the nutritional impact of utilizing pro-vitamin A rich orange flesh sweet potato as part of integrated agricultural nutrition intervention. She led the design and is at the forefront of the implementation of the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative, launched in 2009. Dr. Lowe has worked as a policy analyst for Michigan State University and the International Food Policy Research Institute in Sub-Saharan Africa. With that, help me in welcoming to the podium, Dr. Jan Lowe. Thanks for such a nice introduction. Um, how many here in the room have eaten sweet potato? All right, pretty good, pretty good. And for those of you who haven't eaten sweet potato, why not? What's your image of the sweet potato? <laughs> They're what? <laughs> They're gross. Oh, okay. So I have a little effort to do to convince people today. Um, and, and that's an interesting uh, a take on, you know, different preferences that different people have and how you need to try and meet different preferences when you're trying to do a nutrition intervention. Um, and so I'm going to be talking to you today about our experience in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've been working for the last 30 years. Not always on orange flesh sweet potato, but for certainly during the last 20 years really focused on the vitamin A rich sweet potato. And I'm going to be doing it in the context of food systems, so I want to give you first a bit of background on what we're looking in at in the food systems context. Now, many of you probably have heard about the definitions and the various definitions of food security. And of course, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see this as a high priority that we're going to try and assure a regular food supply and that people have access to food, not in terms of just um, being present, but that the food is of quality. And the utilization of that food is very important. It's also an issue in food security of being able to have a stable supply of that food over time. So the food security concepts have been, you know, in the... Uh, the forefront really since the World Food Summit of 1996 and even before, and these are the four pillars that we've often talked about, about availability of food, uh, making sure that the prices make that food accessible, its utilization, because if you don't utilize it properly, you may not get the nutrients you need, and the stability of that availability in the system. But when people talk about food security, governments tend to have focused a lot on the staple foods as opposed to overall diet diversity. And as we move into the food uh, system context, which is where we're shifting, I think, in terms of the international discussion, with it's more taking a look at the whole chain and all the actors along the chain that are producing the food, the processors, the re retailers, the consumers, and really also taking into account the sustainability of the food system. And I think that's a particular, um, been a lot of attention being paid to that, particularly in Europe and America, that you know we can produce the food, but we also have to be able to produce that food over time, which means we can't damage to the environment to the point which that food production is no longer possible or we lose too much biodiversity. And really, the challenge that we're facing and continue uh, the great crisis I think we'll be facing in this particular century is water. And the fact that food systems are using 85% of the world's water. We're going to have cities and agriculture competing for that water. I come from the state of Colorado. 
And I can tell you, there's not much left in the Colorado River once it goes through California. So the water wars in some places in the world are already starting. And I can tell you in sub-Saharan Africa, the debate over water and how that water is going to be used. So we have to, we must become more efficient in our water use, particularly in agriculture. So all that fits into this food systems perspective. So I think moving away from just talking about food security into this food systems perspective is a good advancement in terms of how we're doing our research and looking at our research and our policy issues, but it does make it much more complex. And the appropriate policies needed on both the demand and supply side to make this work are much more difficult to negotiate than just looking at food security. We also would hope to see, and this is happening in some places, but not enough, is that there's more attention paid to the health and nutrition considerations of what's happening in the food system. So we want a, a food system that delivers better nutrition while minimizing the environmental impact and getting that healthy diet, but also a sustainable diet. So this is uh, the complexity, and you can't see it very well in the back there because it is too small print, and I apologize for that. But it, you can look at the different aspects of this framework for the food system, the food supply chains, the food environments, much more attention to consumer behavior, then you want to look at diets in and of itself. And when you're looking at diets, understanding diets better in terms of quantity, quality, diversity, and safety, and taking your nutrition and health outcomes into account, as well as the impacts on the environment, the economic conditions. And you can overlay this on the uh, older framework of the food security framework of availability, access, utilization. So in some ways, you know, taking this approach is building the more complexity into the simpler models that we talked about before on food security and really understanding that there's a lot of drivers underlying the food system, the demographic drivers, obviously, of high population growth and the changing age structure in a lot of developing countries, in particular, the dominance of youth in the age groups the political drivers, the innovation and technology drivers, and of course, the environmental drivers. So this is the sort of food systems context that we are working in now, and that I wanted to put the sweet potato into that context for you. So these food systems approaches gather all the elements and activities that relate to the production, processing, distribution, preparation, and consumption of food, and also at the same time are trying to capture the output of these activities, including their socioeconomic and environmental implications. We don't want to see future generations compromised uh, in terms of the livability of the environment uh, by building these sustainable food systems. So, we often talk about food being able to fix many problems, but we talk about what we call the triple burden of malnutrition that we actually even, even see now occurring in sub-Saharan Africa in many parts. I think undernourishment is well known. Uh, we still have 45% of under five mortality associated with undernutrition. So uh, clearly this remains the highest priority that we're trying to address when we work on uh, food systems. The area that I've been clearly involved with is known as hidden hunger or micronutrient malnutrition, which is the second part of the triple burden. Two billion persons worldwide have some kind of micronutrient malnutrition. So this is when you're looking at your vitamin A deficiencies, your iron, your zinc, and other micronutrients. And again, you need adequate, diverse diets to get those micronutrients into your diets. And then we have the emerging problem, uh, even in developing countries, of overweight and obesity increasing. So this is why they call it the triple burden. You can have a country with all three problems at once. So as we look 
at uh, the sustainable diet. What do we mean? What do we hope to achieve with a healthy and sustainable diet? And people debate what is a, a good diet. And that debate is ongoing. And there are no correct you know, answers. We know what a really unhealthy diet is, but people are still debating what would be the exact components of the healthiest diet. And FAO put out some, uh, after a long discussion, says, you know, they would say low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security and a healthy life for present and future generations, respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, and nutritionally adequate, safe and health while optimizing natural and human resources. That's a pretty tall set of uh, conflicting conditions. So it's, a, it's going to be a balance between these different things to get an adequate and healthy diet that meets the cultural needs of different populations. But one graph I found that was really interesting to me is when you look at the daily consumption of select food groups by person by world region, because you often hear about the Mediterranean diet and how good the Mediterranean diet is. And if you look at the Mediterranean diet, because of the fewer chronic health problems associated with it, clearly, as we would expect, there's a lot of fruit and vegetable consumption, there's a lot of cereals and root consumption. And what is particularly, I would say, under control in the Mediterranean diet is your meat and fish consumption, you know, is not at the high levels that you would see say in the European diet. This is the meat and fish consumption in the European diet compared to the med Mediterranean diet or the American diet. And then, interesting enough in the Mediterranean diet, there's quite high milk consumption as well. But really what strikes you, as we know, is there's the high levels of fruit and vegetable consumption and also the high level of cereals and roots consumptions, but not as high as in Africa where you don't have enough, you can see how low the fruit and vegetable consumption is in Africa compared to the ideal Mediterranean diet here. So I think it's interesting to see if people say, well, did, do the Mediterranean countries get it right? If that's the case, why not in Sub-Saharan Africa? Let's just promote more fruit and vegetable consumption. So why isn't that happening as fast as we would like it to happen? And one real issue here is the question of low affordability. And, and there was a in very interesting 18-country study uh, done that looked at the recommended number of surveys of fruits and vegetables per day, and the, the recommended amount would be two fruits per day per person, three vegetables per day per person. And what you saw is not surprisingly, that fruit and vegetable consumption decreased as the relative costs uh, increased. And so not surprisingly, where do you see adequate fruit and vegetable consumption? Well, it's in high-income countries. Uh, the mean servings per day were only 2.1 servings of fruits and vegetables in low-income countries. And a lot of this has to do with affordability, the cost of growing the fruits and vegetables, the cost of fruits and vegetables uh, in those societies. So part of it is knowledge, but a lot of it is the relative cost of fruits and vegetables. And if you look at the growth of productivity in agriculture over the last 30 years, a lot of that growth has happened because of investments in increasing cereal productivity. If you look at the increases in productivity, actually there hasn't been good increases in vegetable productivity. So the relative cost of vegetables relative to the cereals has, has gone up over the last 30 years, not down. So we have a, a sense that even in rural areas, uh, vegetables and uh, other fruits are out of the reach of the poorest consumers. So the idea and what we've been working on, uh, this concept of biofortification, if you're looking at the poorest developing countries, yes, of course, everybody wants diversified diets. But an entry point is the fact that these staple crops provide the bulk of calories going into these diets. And that's going to be the case uh, for the medium term and in some cases for the long term. So if you have 50 or 60% of your calories coming from your staples, 
why not improve the micronutrient content of those staples? That is the concept of biofortification. If you look here in this particular diagram, uh, you can have in this example, I think from Bangladesh, 71% of the calorie shares are coming from the staples. And only a very small percent of 6% of the calories are coming from fruits and vegetables. So the idea is if we build in uh, improving the micronutrient content of these staples, this is a good delivery mechanism to get the key major micronutrients into the diet. But can this succeed? First of all, they have to be at levels high enough to make a difference biologically. Second, will the extra nutrients be absorbed at sufficient levels to improve status? And, and of course, importantly, will the farmers adopt them? That means they have to be agronomically competitive with local varieties. And will consumers eat them in sufficient quantities? So they have to be well accepted within those communities. Now here are mislabeled sweet potatoes in the United States. Um, just to clear up any clarification, since I'm speaking to American groups, sweet potatoes are not yams, but they're often mislabeled yams. Yams are a totally different genus. And uh, I don't know wh why it started that way, but um, it's something that um, I've often queried. And at one point, they used to have the Yam Growers Association in America, and they finally changed it to the correct name, the Sweet Potato Growers Association. And then I found out why this is such a hard thing to change. I was visiting North Carolina, and I got a chance to visit the largest sweet potato farm in North Carolina, 14,000 acres, and, and the man's name was Bobby Ham, and he grows ham's yams. And there's no way we're gonna get ham's yams to change it to ham's sweet potato. So I realized we were fighting something that's not gonna change. But in any case, sweet potato is Ipomea batatas, and below, you will see in West Africa, in Nigeria, those are real yams, okay? You can see they're quite different, the Dioscoria, and they're just, they can look like huge elephant feet. And they're white, and they're big, and they you pound them into a, a, a pounded yam as a delicacy in Ghana and Nigeria. But you can see they look quite different from sweet potatoes. So next time you can correct your friends, you are not eating a yam, you are eating a sweet potato. Okay, so a few sweet potato facts for those of you who think it's gross, but also for those of you who love sweet potatoes. There are very few crops that are so diverse. It can grow from sea level to 2,300 meters. One of the big advantages in Sub-Saharan Africa is it can produce on marginal soils as well as good soils. Um, in South Africa, where they irrigate and they use fertilizers, they're getting 40 to 60 tons per hectare. So we have tremendous yield potential to exploit. Flexible harvest and planting times. This is very important and is one of the reasons it's such a climate resilient crop, uh, given the fact that we really have a hard time predicting when those rains are gonna come and how long they're gonna stay. You can eat the roots of the crop. It's a storage root, it's not a tuber. And you can also eat the leaves. Okay, the leaves have high levels of lutein and are very nutritious and have many micronutrients. And the vines are also a very important animal feed. In Sub-Saharan Africa, in most parts of Eastern Southern in particular, women dominated its production. It's vegetatively propagated in Africa, which means you just cut a piece of the vine, replant it, so it's very easy to share with your neighbors. That's great in one way. But you can imagine private sector seed companies aren't interested in sweet potato. Too easy to share with your neighbors. So that's one of our challenges, is getting the materials out. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it has an image of being a crop of the poor. So one of the big challenges we've had is to change the image among government officials to see, by introducing the orange types, that this is a healthy food for all and they shouldn't consider it to be an old-fashioned crop, but really something that's important for the nutrition of their entire community. One of the other things that makes us really excited about promoting the orange flesh sweet potato for climate resilience 
is the fact that it gives high energy output per unit time per unit area. In East and Central Africa, average land holding size is under 0.5 hectares per family. So we're running out of land. Now, in the United States, I believe you have 1.5% of your population in ag agriculture. We're talking about countries that has still have 60 to 70% of their population in agriculture. So land holding size per capita is a serious constraint. So we need crops that can give us, um, and these are under rain-fed conditions, these figures, high edible energy per unit time per unit area. So one of the things that we breed for really is early maturity. We've got a number of varieties now that are three months. So in these bimodal areas where you have two rainy seasons, we can even get three crops per year at times. So we started working, I started working on the orange flesh sweet potato in the mid-1990s when I was a postdoc. And when I came to Sub-Saharan Africa, for whatever reason, sweet potato came from the Americas, and for whatever reason, the varieties that came over and established are dominantly white flesh. That means they have no beta carotene. So it's not like the sweet potatoes you find in the store here, right? And there are a few dominant varieties that are yellow fleshed, and the yellow ones may have some beta carotene, but that could be A or C carotenoid, so you have to test them. So it seems like a no-brainer change, huh? Really. Here you're in a continent where there's, f even today, 48% prevalence of vitamin A deficiency under children under five. Um, and one small root, just this orange sweet potato here, can provide the daily vitamin A needs of a young child. So really the advantage is, if we can get people to accept the orange flesh instead of the white flesh, or in complementary, complementary to the white fleshed, just 100 grams, which is a very small root, meets those daily needs in terms of vitamin A. It's just a marginal change. People already know how to grow sweet potato. And in many countries, it's not seen as a vegetable, it's seen as a staple food. And so when I first brought this up in the 1990s, the reaction I got was, oh, that had been tried before, it failed. African and Asians don't like orange flesh sweet potato. It was rejected, it was tried and rejected. And I said, well, I'm going out to these trials in the field and I'm seeing you're testing 40 different varieties and people seem to like the color. So it was really a standing up to the conventional wisdom. Because within my organization, they were saying, oh no, we have to be demand-led. We have to do what the farmers want. They don't want the orange ones. And I said, well, people don't know about the value of the orange ones, and why are they really rejecting them? And we went and did the research. We found it wasn't because of the color. The color is well loved. It was because of the texture. And if you've ever had a sweet potato from Sub-Saharan Africa, in East Africa, it has what we call a dry matter content of above 30%. I call it stick-in-your-throat sweet potato. You've got to have it with a cup of tea. It's a breakfast food. Whereas the varieties we have here are 18 to 20% dry matter. They're moist, easy to mash, very easy to swallow. All right? So it was a question of we had the wrong texture. It's, it wasn't a question of color rejection. It was a question of not understanding why people were rejecting the sweet potatoes. So don't always accept the, and that was even in the major book that was published in 1992, which was the Bible of sweet potato, saying that Africans and Asians won't eat the orange ones. So I was able to raise some money in that period, a small study, where we were able to look and compare 10 women's groups that got just agriculture with the orange flesh types, and 10 women's groups that received uh, the agriculture intervention with nutrition education, and we did a, just a, a frequency indicator of did it get into the young child diet. And needless to say, having the nutrition education was very important to get the frequency of consumption of the orange flesh sweet potato into the young child diet. And actually when we just did the ag intervention with no nutrition education, 
um, actually the, it went down. It was significant decrease um, in terms of having vitamin A rich foods in the diet. So that gave me the insight that really it's a question of an integrated intervention. If we bring in the orange flesh sweet potato, we must bring it in together with a nutrition education program. And not just talk about the orange flesh sweet potato, but other sources of vitamin A rich foods because we know that a lot of these foods are seasonal. And our goal here is to get improved nutritional intakes among young children. So that was the initial work that I did in Kenya many years ago in 1995. And so we found that the nutrition education component was essential. We realized actually that the children loved the low dry matter orange flesh sweet potatoes because they were easy to swallow. But the adults wanted the high dry matter and guess who decides what's planted on the farm? You know, it's the adults. So we knew we had to breed for better sweet potatoes. We had one yellow flesh variety, but we found it had an adequate uh, beta carotene to really make a difference nutritionally. So we switched and said we'll only focus on the orange types, not the yellow ones, because then there's no confusion. We know the orange ones always have high amounts of beta carotene. And we found during that study that it was easy to incorporate sweet potato into weaning foods, into the young child diet, and with an integrated approach we can make a difference. So, of course, you have to convince, I mean, I was convinced, but I was easy to convince because I believed in what we were doing. But the nutrition community during that period in the 1990s was really promoting supplements, and to a certain extent, they still are today. Give a vitamin A capsule, solves the problem, you don't have to change any behavior, you don't have to alter the food system. And if you give the capsule every six months, it really does give young children adequate vitamin A status. So in the 1990s, there was this huge push for massive vitamin A capsule supplementation and this preference for what I call passive approaches where you don't have to change behaviors. And there was also some research that came out at that time that said we had poor conversion rates in terms of the amount of beta carotene it takes and what it will do to convert into retinol or vitamin A in the body. And some previous conversion rates of six to one were no longer found to be accurate. But fortunately for orange fruits and, and vegetables and for sweet potato, 12 to one is the conversion rate, which means it's still an excellent source of vitamin A. But some of the dark green leaves are 24 to one. And so you'd have to eat a heck of a lot of uh, dark green leaves to get enough vitamin A. So there, on the nutrition side, there was a lot of doubt that we could actually make a difference to young child nutritional status using food-based approaches. But the interesting conundrum was, if you tried to go out, as I was, and raise money to show and demonstrate that evidence, it was very difficult because I spent three and a half years trying to raise money for a study where we could actually go beyond the, take the intervention we were doing, but actually do the consumption studies and then do the blood work to show that we were actually making a difference to vitamin A status in the young children. And I would go and see the health donors and they would say, well, this is an agriculture intervention. Go see the ag people. You go see the ag people and they say, well, this is a health intervention. You know, in that period of time, everybody was in their silos. You know, they weren't talking across disciplines. And this is really a multidisciplinary effort. So it literally took three and a half years to raise money for the study, going to 21 different donors before I was able to raise money for my study in central Mozambique. I believe we have a Brasileiro here. Did Lucas come? Yeah, okay. Muitos anos em Mozambique. And I was able to run this study in central Mozambique, which had been affected by the civil war in Mozambique. And just to give you a, a, a symbol of how poor this population was, 61% of the women in our study had never been to any school. Schools had been closed. It was a 19-year civil war. So you can imagine you know, we had 69% prevalence of vitamin A deficiency in this population. So we were able to set up a community level study 
a quasi-experimental design where we had an intervention groups and control groups. And the, in, in the intervention groups, we did this integrated nutrition education, ag intervention, and in the control groups, obviously, we had no intervention. And this was the integrated intervention model we were testing. And we had the pillar or the branch of the intervention where we're introducing the vitamin A rich sweet potato. And it clearly we want to get more beta carotene into the diet. We want to have better yields and it can increase supply in the off season. So we were looking at some storage options as well. Then you have the branch where you're looking at the nutrition education, what we call demand creation and empowerment through knowledge. How can you use the sweet potato and other vitamin A rich foods? We use it as an entry point for talking about better nutrition in general, uh, better diets, increased knowledge, and of course, key messages on breastfeeding and other good p practices. Because we want to see increased intake of vitamin A and energy into the diet. And then on the marketing side, the marketing component was smaller, but I think still very relevant. Because what we see is when there's a marketing component, you're going to get more sustained orange flesh sweet potato cultivation over time and accelerated adoption. And all these should work together with the increased intake going into the young child and the whole family in general what we wanted to see that this would lead to increased serum retinol levels, which you can't see very well on the slide here, but that was the vitamin A status indicator uh, by taking blood samples to prove that we actually made a difference to vitamin A status in the young children. So did the intervention impact the young child diet? Yes, uh, after an 18 month intervention period, we saw that the median intake of vitamin A was almost eight times higher uh, in the intervention group than in the control group. And the orange flesh sweet potato was contributing overall 35% of that increased intake. And on the days when it was consumed, 90% of that vitamin A. And then we found really that once the children had one year of age, they weren't being fed the sweet potato on the side as a special dish, but they were eating it as part of the overall family intake. So it had been important to really include the men as well as the women in the whole demand creation strategy to get sweet potato into the family diet. And you can see compared to the control children, uh, really the orange flesh sweet potato was an incredibly important source of vitamin A, but we also made a slight impact on improving energy intakes as well, because through the nutrition education, the children started eating breakfast. Many of them had never had breakfast before. And then most importantly, to convince the nutrition community that we were really impacting vitamin A status, we were able to demonstrate a drop uh, from baseline to the end of the study from 60% to 38% prevalence of vitamin A deficiency in the intervention group compared to the control group staying around 52 to 53%. So that was a, uh, we could attribute a 15% drop in the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency to the integrated intervention. So that really began to raise the awareness that we can make a difference with an integrated agriculture nutrition approach using the orange flesh sweet potato as a key entry point. Concurrent around this time, uh, there was another study that was done under controlled conditions in South Africa by Van Yardsveld and his group, where they, it's not, it wasn't in a community setting like we were doing in Mozambique, but in a school setting where you could regulate what children were eating, and they had them eating the orange flesh sweet potato versus the white fleshed, and they were able to use a technique that demonstrated that when they were feeding 120 grams of the school children, of the sweet potato to the school children for five days a week for three months, they saw improved amounts of vitamin A stored in the liver. So we had these two different methods for demonstrating that we could impact young child vitamin A status using the orange flesh sweet potato as an entry point. 
Then the question is, can you take these models to scale? So then there was a very important follow-up study that was led by Harvest Plus, and the International Potato Center was a sub-grantee on this. Um, we worked together to say, how can we go and reach 24,000 households using this integrated approach? In this pilot study I had done, we had you know, been able to reach out and do very detailed intervention and collection on a limited number of households. But can we take this model to scale? Um, and here, we tested using that integrated ag nutrition approach. In model one, we had the nutrition intervention for two years. In model two, we just had the nutrition intervention for one year. And the idea here was saying, well, can we go to scale, but also can we reduce the cost per beneficiary? And in this study, we did find that we were able, going and scaling in Mozambique and Uganda to 24,000 households, that we were able to get high adoption rates of over 60%, and positive outcomes on vitamin A intakes, both among the children, and we also measured the vitamin A intakes among the mothers. And we found really in this, as you can see, the difference between baseline and end line in model one and model two was not that different in Mozambique. And ironically, in Uganda, model two was actually better than model one, which had the two years of nutrition education, which was unexpected. But the bottom line being is we were able to get vitamin A intakes up significantly, and we found that model two uh, being, we could get by with just doing one year of nutrition education. And since model two is 33, percent cheaper to implement than Model 1, this is a good finding for w wanting to scale these kinds of interventions. So we really worked out in this study what it would take in terms of the average cost to reach a direct beneficiary, which is somebody participating in the whole program, and the marginal cost of adding on indirect beneficiaries, which may be people in the community that benefit from getting the vines or participate in other ways like exposure to radio programs. And the, the key here is clearly it was more expensive to work in a less densely populated country like Mozambique with poor road infrastructure than in a country like Uganda. But in the end, the good news is that really if when we compared it in terms of the disability life years saved, it cost 15 to 20 dollars for every disability life year saved which by the WHO means it's considered to be a cost-effective public health intervention. So really, we have spent these years uh, establishing a very solid evidence base for integrated ag nutrition to make a difference to human health in pretty difficult settings in terms of um, getting the uh, intervention out to the population. The other conventional wisdom um, we had to address actually was in within the agriculture community. I don't know, um, in the global agricultural research community in the 1990s, there was declining funding. And a lot of work was going on to show really how can we save money and, and organizations like the International Potato Center said, well, we'll breed in Peru for the rest of the world you know, because we can't afford to put breeding programs everywhere. There just weren't, weren't resources. Um, and truly, when you looked at it, there was just a dearth of breeders everywhere, and particularly in Africa. And breeding programs do uh, require significant resources. So there was sort of this image of our conventional wisdom that we can serve the world from a center location. But when I was down in Zambezia, I realized that this wasn't working. We actually had some great varieties out there during the research I was doing in 2002 and 2003. One was known as Resisto. Farmers really liked it. It yielded really well. It had a beautiful shape. Uh, traders liked it. But I recognized, uh, being out in the field, that when I was comparing it to the local Czech, after the long dry season, Resisto would give us a second crop in the valley bottoms in the dry season, but then there were no vines left to replant in the rainy season. Whereas the local variety gave less yield of roots,
that had vigorous vines left for the next season. Now, which one of those do you think is going to survive in sub-Saharan Africa in a unimodal setting like that? So that made me realize and start to campaign for breeding in Africa for Africa. And of course, even my own organization didn't want to necessarily hear that. But I recognized that if we didn't do that, we weren't going to meet the long-term needs. We were going to have to have, be constantly putting these varieties out there that weren't going to make it in the system. And so I was fortunate to be able to convince the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that this argument made sense. And we've really spent, since 2009, under the project I lead known as Sasha, building a community of practice of breeders together in, uh, with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And this is the community of practice of breeders now. The, the, together, nine breeders have been trained. We at SIP, our head breeders, have developed a very interesting technique called accelerated breeding, which basically means just taking advantage of the fact you have more sites earlier in your conventional breeding process that we can now get varieties out in four to five years instead of eight years. So we call this group the speed breeders. And we're tackling new methods, looking at heterosis and molecular markers to keep speeding up our breeding process. Because without the adapted varieties, we can't go to scale anywhere and make a difference. So we're really proud of this breeding of community of practice. In 2005, we had two countries breeding. Now we have 13. OK. And so being able to get those varieties out has made a tremendous difference in being able to make a difference on a larger scale. And finally, the last conventional wisdom I want to bring up today is, uh, and I'm an economist, right? Uh, so this is an interesting thing to have to address. But everybody says we must respond to what the market demands. Uh, all our technologies must be demand-driven. And I'm a scientist, and I believe in evidence, obviously. But I also recognize that no one wakes up in the morning saying, I feel vitamin A deficient. If people don't know what it is, what can they demand? So really, I think one of the things we did with this program was really promote this idea of demand creation. How do we make it fun to learn about nutrition? How do we put the message out? And I'm sure you've noticed I'm in orange clothes. A lot of people thought we as researchers were a little bit crazy out there, dressing in orange, painting our buildings in orange, distributing orange cloth. But all this is about building an orange brand, that ra radio programs and marketing advertisement is needed to create awareness about good nutritional practice. I always say we can learn from Coca-Cola, but do something that's good for health. So in 2009, we launched the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative, which was a multi-partner, multi-donor initiative to reduce child malnutrition and improve smallholder incomes in 10 million African countries by 2020. And again, at the foundation of this initiative was the Sasha project I mentioned, which was breeding the right varieties doing the research to address the bottlenecks in our seed systems. And since that time, with this new group of sweet potato spree breeders throughout Africa, we have released 131 varieties, 81 of which are orange flesh sweet potato. And that's the foundation of being able to do what we want to do at scale. Another challenge we are addressing in this program we recognize that the world is changing and rapid. The fastest urbanizing population in the world is on the African continent. And urban consumers like convenience, and they're more health conscious. As I mentioned, we do have the triple burden emerging in our major cities in Africa as well. And so we're very much into getting orange flesh sweet potato consumed I would say 99% is boiled or steamed, which is an excellent way to eat it. But we really need to integrate it into the urban milieu if the product is going to make it in the urban areas. And so what we've been focused on is integrating it into traditional dishes like the one shown here in Nigeria, where it's part of the igusi. 
But also, we've been focused on doing partial wheat flour substitution with orange flesh sweet potato puree, which is steamed and mashed sweet potato. Because most African countries have to import their wheat. Any, and it, all these countries that we're dealing with can grow sweet potato. So it's a sort of a win-win for farmers. If we can substitute 20 to 60% of wheat flour in a given baked product with orange flesh sweet potato puree. It's cheaper than wheat flour, so the bakers make money. And you can see it puts in uh, vitamin A into the product and makes it a nice golden color. So we've successfully developed these value chains in Rwanda with the Golden Power Biscuit, and in Kenya with Tusky Supermarkets and Organic Foods making sweet potato bread to really get these products moving um, and make a difference uh, in terms of incomes as well as nutrition. To backstop this, we have a new laboratory uh, together with the Biosciences for Eastern and Central Africa facility in Nairobi to really do the nutritional analysis to ensure that these products have enough beta carotene to be considered vitamin A enhanced. And obviously we do a lot of shelf life studies and our goal has been really to come up with a puree that's shelf storable without refrigeration for up to three months to make it as convenient to use as flour. We also see a lot of opportunities, again, as we were talking about Climate Smart, to integrate with other crops. So we've been doing research on how we look at the integration of sweet potato with rice in irrigation schemes. And we can see in this kind of uh, example here, this is after a two and a half year study. We saw that sweet potato root yield was higher when it was done overall in rotation with rice than when it was just monocropped. And likewise for the rice, we had significantly higher yields of the rice when it was in rotation with sweet potato compared to the control. We're doing a lot of um, uh, studies now comparing how we integrate better with maize, groundnut intercropping, and do the comparison. Again, looking at this idea of sustainable systems that incorporate orange flesh sweet potato. So as of September 2018, we've reached 5.3 million households across the uh, 16 target countries. I'm worried, we're getting close to the deadline, we still have a long way to go. But we're making progress, and I think we're showing that we can make a difference uh, by promoting integrated ag nutrition approaches. Thanks for your attention. I think, uh, may you have a good diverse diet, and may it be full of color. Thank you. That there we go. Okay, so I know we're getting close. Um, I know we got some that may have one o'clock class, but if anybody has any questions, um, no, no worries. We'd be um, happy to take any questions. Also, if you want to stick around um, and just ask some questions, we're probably going to be around for 15 minutes or so. Um, that if anybody wants to ask questions or come down and visit, but does anybody have a question that they're just dying to ask right now? Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, this has been a real treat. Um, I love sweet potatoes, and I'm really curious, um, the varieties that we grow here, you know, the Jetstar and the Beauregard, are they as, what's their vitamin A content um, in comparison to the varieties that you're growing in Africa? Yes, the varieties you're growing here are as, as, as high or higher. Uh, because there's a genetic correlation between, a negative correlation between dry matter and uh, beta carotene. So actually you can get to much higher levels of beta carotene content. The American varieties last about three months in Africa because we have different viruses and our virus pressure is very high. And so, um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't do well in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, except in very low virus pressure areas, they may last a couple of years. So this is why it's so important to breed locally. 
All right, I think I got this one working now. You got that one working? Well, you know, it was pretty easy to recruit. Unfortunately, the, the breeders and the, a lot of breeders actually were put into a, a PhD training program, so they had to apply for that, to participate in that training program. Unfortunately, a lot of the national programs don't support their um, breeders very well, so what we did was work with them to help them write grants and get support from the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, because people want to work. It's just getting the funds to do the work. Um, so we really, I think we have a very strong community of practice in terms of people who are excited. And the nice thing about sweet potato, unlike cassava, you know, cassava you might have to wait 12 months to 18 months to get your harvest. You can make pretty good breeding progress fast um, with a crop like sweet potato. So that's encouraging to young breeders. Have you done any similar research using this in, in the equatorial areas of, of Central and, and South America to see if there's any possibility of expanding it over to, to that area instead of just Africa? Our headquarters at the International Potato Center is in Peru, and that's where our global leader is. So actually he has some very nice varieties for South and Central America. Unfortunately, donors aren't willing to support much work in South America um, uh, because they see South America has the resources. But certainly we share our genetic resources with Brazil, Ecuador. Um, we have, I think, some varieties that have just gone to Haiti. But it's a really, if anybody has resources to use these materials, we, we have the varieties that would work well in South America. It's just getting the resources to get them out. And of course, camote in Peru is something that's served along with ceviche. It's a part of the tradition, um, and it's orange. And in, in South America, they like the low dry matter ones better. So it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer for South America. Very good. Well, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at Hawkeye today. And like I said, if anybody has any questions, um, Feel free to stick around. We'll be around for a little bit and happy to chat. So thanks for coming. Thanks for your time.